Michigan Radio and the Detroit Journalism Cooperative have launched an exciting project in a neighborhood on Detroit's east side. Residents are recording their own news stories about the community in a podcast called Morningside 48224. Here's a brief tour of the area, courtesy of Monique Tate and Imani Mixon. We are in the Morningside community, which is on the east side of Detroit, and it's in the northeast area. Our community is about two miles long by one mile wide. Our borders on our west are Alter Road, on our south, Mac, north, I-94, and east is Outer Drive. I feel like people are like fuzzy on what the boundaries are, you know, it depends on who you talk to and when they were here. <laughs> the community has about 5,500 homes and was considered pretty much of a middle class and maybe some lower or moderate uh, incomes. But we were significantly hit and impacted, of course, by the 2009 recession, just as many were. So we went through a significant amount of um, abandonment. Right now, we probably are closer to having about 4,000 occupied properties as opposed to the 5,500 or so that are here. You can see, even though some of these are neglected, they still have great bones to mm -hmm. them. And they can be renovated and restored to be magnificently beautiful properties. For sure. We're traveling right now on Outer Drive. What we're approaching are both the area where we have our community-based meetings because we have a very strong community organization in Morningside that just celebrated its 40th anniversary, actually. To our left is Bethany Lutheran School. It's not functioning as much as a school, but it's a fabulous church. They're very open, very community-oriented and supported. To our right is the Ronald Brown Academy. Now, this is the original building. We are quite fortunate because, as you can see, the brick change. It's the new structure. It was K-5, to but it just transitioned to K-8 to this year. We are very fortunate with Detroit having over 100 school closings, we retained both of our K-8 to schools. And the schools are the key mm -hmm. to the sustainability of these areas. This to our left is the other K-8. to Clark Academy did not get a renovation, but I'll say that they have power in their administration. As you can see, we have a bunch of wonderful and eclectic homes where the predominance of them are brick. Some of them have really large lots in the backyards. Thank God we're in the return and upswing. Not only are we increasing occupancy, it's considered the neighborhood to be in or to come to. I don't think I can think of another neighborhood that has this many different kind of houses. I know, you know? very eclectic, right? Yeah. These fantastic, beautiful homes that we have are a plus, but what's an additional plus is that our neighborhood is also very comprehensive. We have the Jefferson Branch Library here, which is wonderful. It sponsors a lot of great community projects, and that's how we're restoring East Warren project. Before I get on that, we're right here in front of the historic Alger. They're also a fabulous community partner. This area to the right of us, this is being restored by the Alger Theater. The Friends of the Alger Theater have completed like any kind of asbestos removal and all of that, and they have completed the seating, the stage, but they are still a ways to go, but they're really diligent at working on mm -hmm. it, and they're going to be opening a rooftop space this summer. Mm -hmm. I've just arrived at Mac. To the right, of course, is our Gross Point border, and left is everything Morningside. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mac is a big deal. So like East Warren is, is also a big deal, but Mac, Mac is something else. Mac is engaged in a corridor improvement project as well. You see new businesses popping up all the time. This is one of the new businesses, the Paradise Cafe, and then this is the sweet shop. We covered a whole lot and you work on a whole lot, so I just wonder, is there one thing that you're most excited about? And I guess I'm excited about new residents. We now have very viable and walkable spaces and places and just looking forward to more people coming over to the east side and getting homes in the morning side area. So right. keep that part. Make me want to buy a home. <laughs> one day, one day. 
Joining me now is journalist Imani Mixon, who is heading up the podcast project. Welcome to American Black Journal. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So in the last segment, we were just talking about the importance of being able to tell your own story and how this show was was part of sort of the debut of that here on broadcast television uh, in Detroit. This is sort of the same idea, right? right. Uh, things are changing in Detroit. We read a lot about what that change looks like to people who don't live through it, right. this is a way to give those folks a chance to say, here's here's how it looks every day uh, from my vantage point. For sure. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely exciting to think about it almost as a lineage thing, right? Like, mm -hmm. this is not new work. People have always had stories to tell, always been living a very honest and true life, and this is just one way to document what's happening. So yeah. that's been really fun. Yeah. So, so tell me a little about Morningside, which is an area that I know about because I grew up here in the in the city, but I don't think a lot of people even know necessarily where that is. Exactly. So even Morningsiders themselves don't call it Morningside. <laughs> don't call it Morningside necessarily. They call it the right? East Side. They yeah. call it by intersection. They call it by landmark. Um, <laughs> high so school. That's exactly. High school <laughs> affiliation, whatever. So um, that's been really interesting. But I grew up in the neighborhood mm -hmm. um, and kind of understood it as Morningside when I was growing up. So it's on Detroit's very far east side, right near Gross Point, and like kitty corner to a lot of other very important neighborhoods like East English Village and Cornerstone um, and things like that. But it's, you know, it's not downtown, it's mm -hmm. not midtown, mm -hmm. so life is different and the amenities are different. And um, it's a place that has always been a celebrated and established neighborhood and now people are sort of pushing their futures into being there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that change narrative that we hear and fight about sometimes in Detroit, and I think it's actually a healthy fight to have, mm. right? Yeah. It, change for whom, for the benefit of, of, of whom. Uh, uh, talk about change that's taking place in Morningside as seen from people who live there. For sure, I think the more surrounding areas get love and attention. Yeah. You sort of think about your own neighborhood in that context and wonder what it would look like if you were given that much time and attention, mm -hmm. right? So people really have sort of the very basic needs of like a home, safety, a school, but then there's also this imagination of like, okay, what if we had a business district again? Right. And you know, what if I had a grocery store or multiple grocery stores to choose from and didn't have to cross Mac to find right. it? Right. Um, so it's been really inter interesting to talk to people who have the resources to make the changes happen and then talk to people who are living within this change. Yeah. Um, but my hope is always that the people who have been there can shape what happens to them. So what are you hearing from them uh, as, you're, as you're giving them the opportunity to tell those stories? How do they feel they're included or not included? Yeah. Um, I think people are very committed to being there. So it's not like this is day one in Morningside. It's right. like we've been here for generations. Right. We're and I'm not going anywhere. Deep. Right. right. <laughs> so these are the things that I know y'all have tried to do that haven't worked. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, school, safety, like just open places for people to exist, like mm -hmm. parks and even farms um, are always on their mind. And I think they're a little more civically minded than other neighborhoods who already have those things. Huh. So they are bringing people to task, showing up to community meetings, uh -huh. or you know, kind of taking it in their own hand, making a pocket park on the corner. Yeah. Um, but I think there is still hope because so many things are happening that it's like we have to get, you know, something has to come this way or we can make something happen here. Yeah, so, so one of the things I'm really involved in is, is a project around the home where my family lived when I was born. Mm -hmm. Uh, on Tuxedo near Livernois and, and Grand River. West Side. Um, west side. Okay, that's all right. uh, I grew up on the east side, <laughs> but I was born on the west side. It's a big deal here, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, one of the things that, that I struggle with uh, in, in that project is the sadness mm -hmm. uh, that, that you get from thinking of what you remember, what you grew up with and what's there now and trying to reconcile that against the, the need to to say, uh, we gotta keep, keep working, things can get better, they right. will get better. I, I wonder if you feel some of that too in, in Morningside. Definitely, I think, you know, as a Detroiter who went abroad and came back, or went away to school and came back, things mm -hmm. are completely different. You miss, mm -hmm. it seems like a whole century if mm -hmm. you're gone for five years. <laughs> so, um, kind of um, knowing that that's a fact, and then realizing like, okay, these people or that neighborhood is not my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So given what we have and the time that we have and the resources we have, what's the best possible outcome and right. how can we make that happen in little immediate bits? Um, but I think, you know, a lot of people are talking about how Detroit is not 
being gentrified at the same rate or in the same way as other places, but if we've never experienced anything like this, if I'm used to only seeing 98% black people around me and now I don't, right. I'm going to feel something, I'm gonna say something. Mm -hmm. So I think that the loss and the sadness can you know, be turned into a functional and productive way of thinking how you wanna feel that void. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it is definitely something that people bring up all the time. Yeah. Uh, what do the people of Morningside, what do their ex expectations look like? Not just for themselves, but for the rest of the city, for, for politicians. Do they, do they have that uh, belief that, yeah, things are going to get better still? Mm, I'm not sure. I think that's, that's a big ask. Yeah. I think a lot of the, the conversations I end up in um, are around like permanence and stability, mm -hmm. where you know you can't really always live from paycheck to paycheck or from this house to this house or this job to this job. So just that idea, that very basic American dream of like stability and sustainability um, comes up very often. Sure. And I see people that are working and thinking forward. Like in the same way you can build a nice cute restaurant downtown one day and everybody's there next Sunday, that's not the same as life work, as family work, it as is community such a different, work. It is such a different task. Mm -hmm. It is so much longer term. For sure. So it's nice to be welcomed, welcomed into a community that is already community minded. Mm -hmm. Like nobody is being selfish. Nobody is shutting doors in my face, mm -hmm. which can happen sure. <laughs> in journalism. Yeah, it's right. not happening yet. <laughs> um, so they kind of already have, they have everything they need in their mind. And now it's like materializing that yeah. and you know, being able to vocalize that to the people who can make physical changes happen. Can make the difference. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Well, congratulations on the work. Congratulations for going home to do the yeah, work. Yeah, yeah. It really matters. I'm excited to be here. It's yeah. a good time.